For the last 1,500 years, Catholic theology has been shaped by the enduring influence of two intellectual giants, St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, a third figure has appeared to present the faith of the Church in the language of our own age. Explore the dynamics of the teaching of Pope John Paul II on the program Faith for Today with Father Richard Hogan. My name is Father Richard Hogan, and I'm a priest of the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis in Minnesota, and I've been assigned by our Archbishop there to work full-time with Priests for Life, a national pro-life organization devoting itself to the promotion of the gospel of life, particularly regarding abortion and euthanasia. However, I'm at the EWTN radio studios this afternoon to continue the series called Faith for Today, which presents the teachings of the Catholic Church, the teachings of Christ, according to the mindset and synthesis of Pope John Paul II. As we mentioned in the first two programs of this series, John Paul II has united the kernels of revelation where Christ came to reveal to us about ourselves and God with a modern philosophical movement called phenomenology. And the union of revelation with phenomenology in the structure of John Paul II has yielded a new synthesis or a new way of presenting the faith. This, as we said, is the third synthesis in the West. The first was that of St. Augustine, who used the philosophy of Plato, and the second was that of St. Thomas Aquinas, who used the philosophy of Aristotle. And now, with John Paul II, we have a modern 20th and 21st century synthesis, which is appropriate for our age, yielding a language Uh, for the faith, which makes more sense to us than that of the previous two. Although it's perfectly legitimate and and fine to understand the faith in any of these. One does not have to abandon St. Thomas or St. Augustine uh, in order to understand John Paul II or vice versa. In the last program, number three, we were finally talking about the uh, mystery of God. We started with the human person and we said that events of everyday life, experiences of everyday life, particularly of striking beauty, natural beauty, or it can be a man-made beauty, um, great musical composition, uh, a, a work of art, a skyscraper, a great engineering feat, can be any of these things. A- any kind of experience of beauty yields in most of us questions which go to the fundamental heart of who we are. Where did I come from? Where did all this come from? Who am I? Where am I going? And these questions can only be answered by God. These questions are what John Paul II would call an opening onto the mystery of the divine. Because ultimately these questions can only be answered by the deity because we're created by him. And we, in the words of St. Augustine, do not rest until we rest in God himself. And so our final home and the final answers to our questions can only be found in God himself. So... These questions coming out of our consciousness, our self-awareness, our, our ability to watch ourselves do something, these questions open us up to God and show us that there's something beyond this world and beyond us. And this then yields the idea that God is the creator. And we were talking about, in the last program, the characteristics of God. We talked about him as the uncaused cause. One cannot go back infinitely um, positing someone else who was responsible for existence. In other words, you can't, you can't say, well, my parents had me and then the grandparents had them and so forth and so forth to Adam and Eve. Well, where did Adam and Eve came, come from? Well, that was from nature. Uh, where did nature come from? Well, that was the Big Bang. Where did the Big Bang come from? Well, that was God. Where did God come from? God prime? God double prime? God triple prime? No. There ha- it has to stop. And it stops with God, who is defined as the uncaused cause, as we said. He causes everything, but he himself was not caused by anything, and nothing can act on him. So he's the uncaused cause, the origin of everything in the universe. Um, And we talked about how every attribute, because he is being itself or existence itself, and we think about that, we mentioned as an ocean, an ocean of being or existence, Every attribute that exists in him exists in that ocean. So everything is totally identified with his essence, which is being or existence. So he's perfectly simple. 
We talked about how he loves and quoted Paul, Pope Paul VI, that being in love expresses the divine reality most appropriately. So God is the uncaused cause. Every attribute, every every characteristic exists in his essence and is totally identified with his essence, which is being. He loves because he created us and shared existence with us in the world, and that's why being in love expressed him. We talked about the attribute of power. How could God create out of nothing without that? We mentioned that he was totally perfect, had all the perfections. We also talked about how he cannot change because he cannot be caused to change by an outside force since he's the uncaused cause, and he doesn't change from within, and sometimes we decide to change this or that about ourselves because we do that in order to make ourselves better, but God is all perfect. He lacks nothing. He has to be, otherwise he wouldn't be existence itself. We showed how he was spiritual and immaterial, and that is to say, without a body. Sometimes people think of spiritual as being synonymous with supernatural. It really isn't. Supernatural is something, quote, above nature. That's what the word means. Whereas spiritual means something that's non-corporeal, non-physical. Uh, souls are spiritual, but they're not supernatural. Um, bodies are natural, even though they have they are the expression of spiritual realities such as the soul. They are natural, just like the soul is. Well, God is spiritual, that is to say he's non-corporeal, doesn't have a body, because otherwise he would change, and we've already shown that he cannot change. And we were talking about last time at the very end that because God cannot change, he is timeless. He stands outside of time. Now, by that we mean that he doesn't experience any kind of movement of time because time is fundamentally a measure of change. When you think about the basic measurement of time, the the day, 24 hours in a day, they're not 27 or 38 or 42 or whatever, because the measure of a day is the amount of time it takes the earth to turn on its axis and have, have the sun sh shine on the entire earth. That's a measure of a day. A month is the uh, cycle of the moon, and a year is the orbit of the earth around the sun. These are all movements. Movements are, are change. So time is a measure of change or movement. If there is no time, excuse me, if there's no change, there can't be any time. So God, without, without change, is absolutely timeless. One example of this is in these science fiction programs, Star Trek and the others. I don't know how many of you watch these things, but they're part of the popular culture. Whenever there is a, a, a freezing of movement, the clocks stop. And this is perfectly logical because clocks measure change. When there is no change, there is no time. So without change and there is none for God, God does not have any time. He stands outside of time. He is eternity itself. Now, one way to express this is that God looks at time as we look at a movie screen. In other words, all of history, every single change, every single movement, every, every single development is seen on this movie screen from the beginning to the end. So he sees Adam and Eve, the end of the world, Christ, everything all at once, and all of our lives all at once. It's shown on this movie screen, and he's the only one in the theater watching the screen. And this image is frozen. It's there permanently. And that's his vision. It's not so much that eternity is a succession of minutes, days, hours, weeks, and so on. Rather, God stands totally outside of time and in a way observes it, but he observes it as though everything is happening in the present. An example of this would be standing on top of a skyscraper looking down on a city street. You And say you're looking down on a corner and you see cars coming from both directions. You see everything in the present, even though, and you may even see that this, these two cars are going to crash even though the two drivers do not see this coming because the buildings obscure their vision. You see it because you're looking down. You're outside of the event looking down, and you can see that uh, you can see what the succession of minutes, days, and hours is going to do to these two cars. In a certain sense, but the example limps a bit, 
But in a certain sense, that's God's vision, although God's vision obviously is much, much broader than, than uh, looking down on a city street from a skyscraper. Nevertheless, it gives you some idea of uh, the way God looks at time, the way God looks at the universe. It's important to remember that when talking about God, most of the examples we use limp. In other words, they're not satisfactory. They can't explain this mystery completely. They can give us an inkling, an idea, a way of thinking about it, but they can't fundamentally explain the mystery because God is the ultimate mystery of the universe. And even in heaven, even in heaven, we're not going to understand God completely. We'll understand a lot more than we do now, but we will not be able to comprehend this mystery completely. It, is, it lies beyond, God lies beyond the capability of the human intellect to understand, even with what St. Thomas calls the light of glory, which is the special grace given to us in heaven so that we may, quote, see, unquote, God. So God is timeless because he is changeless, and he's eternity itself. Now, these attributes of timelessness and changelessness also yield another aspect of God, and that is that he is without emotions. Now, this troubles most people because they haven't thought of it this way. If God is changeless, if he does not have a body, if he is timeless, then how can he have emotions? Emotions, the very word means to draw out of. For example, most of the time we talk about getting angry. In other words, there was a time when we weren't, ang we weren't angry, and then the time that we are angry, and there's a change in us. Also, this change is very physical. With powerful emotions, we experience bodily changes. There are chemicals released. There are other psychological, physical changes, including other chemicals, which are released through the hormones in the body. And so we have a physical reaction. Now, since God cannot be caused to do anything, since he can't change, there can't be a time where he's one way and a time where he's another way. So he can't get angry, for example, or he can't, um, quote, fall in love in the sense that all of a sudden there's somebody he loves that he didn't love before. All of this is impossible because he's changeless and because he doesn't have a body. So he doesn't have emotions. Now, this does not mean that he doesn't love. Clearly, he loves. He loves with a passion, but it's a non-corporeal, non-emotional sort of experience for him. Love, and it's important to note this, love is an act of the will. When we say, I love you, it means we choose in our free wills to give ourselves to this other person or to this group of people. We make a decision. Love is a decision that is a self-gift in the will. I choose to give myself to you. God, having a will, obviously, chooses to give himself to us. That's what love is. When he created the world, he gave himself because he shared being or existence, and he is existence. He chose to give himself. This was a choice, an act of the will, which was then carried out because of his attribute of power. So God loves, but he doesn't love in an emotional sense. Now, at this point in the explanation, usually people quote the Old Testament to me and say, well, Father, it says God gets angry in the Old Testament. Of course it says, but it's anthropomorphic. It was a way of understanding God's justice. It was a way of understanding God as best they could. Remember, the Old Testament did not reveal the fullness of the mystery of God or any other mystery. The Old Testament was preliminary revelation. It was part of revelation. It, that was completed and fulfilled in Christ. So we don't look to the Old Testament as the total revelation of uh, the, any of the mysteries of the faith. And emotion is impossible for God in the, in the human sense, that is to say a physical change, any kind of change, because God is timeless, changeless, and without a body. This does not mean, and I want to emphasize this point, that he does not love. Obviously, he loves passionately. That's revealed to us. It's revealed in every word of the scriptures. It's revealed in every act of the Holy Spirit through the church. It's revealed in every single act of Christ. There is no question. But he doesn't love it in the emotional sense, in the sense that there is a physical, emotional, changeable reaction in him. 
In fact, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger talks about the heart of God, and you might say, well, how can, how can you use that kind of language if it isn't an emotional love? And the reason why the Cardinal can talk this way is because if love is offered, and clearly God offers love to every single human being, he offers love, he says, I give myself to you. Well, that love, if offered, can be rejected, can be, can be uh, turned against the person. In other words, <clears throat> if God offers me love, which he does for every single one, and I say, go take a hike, I don't want any part of you, stay out of my life, that quote hurts God, not in the same way that we get hurt, but nevertheless, when there's an offer made, that offer when rejected, quote, hurts, not in an emotional sense, but in a spiritual sense. This is the, the spiritual sense of pain and suffering that God can experience. A parent missing a child longs for the child. The heart of God is the heart of a loving father who longs for his children. This is not an emotional hurt just as his, God's love is not an emotional love. Nevertheless, he does have the heart because he loves so so intensely and infinitely. In fact, we cannot even imagine how infinitely God loves us. Now, we need to talk briefly about four other attributes of God. And one of them is that he is infinite. And he's infinite, and this is based on the fact that he is eternity. That is the fact that he is timeless. He is infinite because he is eternity itself. He's also immeasurable, and that flows from the infinity, incomprehensible from the infinity. We cannot comprehend the infinite, infinite, and transcendent, meaning he stands above creation or outside of creation. So there's no way that we can possibly know him or comprehend him. There's no way that can, we can reach up to him to heaven because he is transcendent. There's no way that he can ever be bounded or limited because he is eternity itself. So beginning with the fact that God is the uncaused cause, we have shown that he is um, simple because every single attribute of his belongs to his essence, which is to be. He loves us, and we know that through creation. He is being in love then, as Pope Paul VI indicated, he has the attribute of power. He is all perfect. He cannot change. He is spiritual and immaterial, meaning without a body. Stands outside of time, so he's eternity itself. Being, being unchangeable and standing outside of time, he does not have emotions. And lacking emotions and being eternity itself, he's infinite, immeasurable, incomprehensible, and transcendent. Nevertheless, even though he lacks emotions in our sense, he has a heart because he loves. And that love can be wounded, the heart can be wounded, when the love that God offers us is rejected. And this constitutes then the reflection on God as one. The next uh, topic in this series, of course, is the mystery of the Trinity. One last comment on the divine nature or God as one is very, very important. I've said it before, but it's important to emphasize here again. We are talking here of the one nature of God in the mystery of the Godhead. That is to say, the divinity. We are not talking about the second person of the Blessed Trinity, who, while united to this one nature, one divine nature for all eternity, became man, that is to say, assumed a human nature at a particular time and in a particular place. As man, in his humanity, clearly, uh, Christ feels emotions, and knows change, and so on. But that's in the humanity. We've been talking here, God as one, God in the divine nature, God in the mystery of the oneness of, of um, the Creator himself. Now, moving on to this mystery of the Trinity, I need to warn you that if you thought that the the attributes of God were a bit complex. We are now moving into an area which is much more difficult. Just bear with me. This does yield fruit. It is important to think about it at least for a little bit. It may be a little bit um, mind-stretching, and you might end up with a headache, but at least a brief reflection on this is important. Just, just to uh, console you a little bit, St. Augustine, living in the... Uh, fourth and fifth centuries, wrote a book called De Trinitate, or On the Trinity. 
And at the very end of it, after 400 pages or so, he basically said that it's really better not to think about these things. That was after 400 pages. In a certain sense, he's right. We simply believe in the Trinity. We believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We learned it from our mothers at our mother's knee. We learned it in church when we first went there, when we made the sign of the cross. We learned it in kindergarten or preschool. And it's a very, very important to teach the Trinity to all ages because if you do not teach the Trinity, then the Jews were right and Jesus can't be God if there is no Trinity because there is only one God and that God's in heaven. And therefore, the Jews were right. If there's only one God and there is no Trinity, then Jesus is not God and he was indeed blasphemy. Obviously, that's not the Christian faith because the heart of the Christian faith, the first, the first belief is the belief in the three persons in one God. First, in the sense that this is essential to our name Christian because our name Christian means that we accept Jesus, the Lord, the second person of the blessed Trinity, God himself who became man. Now, there are really four questions about the Trinity that we need to consider. The first is the, what is called the processions. Remember in the Creed, we talk about the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son. And we talk about the Son as begotten, not made, one in being with the Father through whom all things were made. Both the begottenness of the Son and the procession of the Holy Spirit are referred to in theology as the processions. That is to say, how, how is it possible from the one God to have three? Then, of course, if, if there are three persons, you, one has to consider what is the difference between them. We have just spent a good amount of time talking about the oneness and simplicity of God. If God is one, one divine nature, then how can there possibly be three persons? So the question is, what distinguishes each person from the other two because they're united to the same simple one divine nature? The third mystery, mystery involves the activity of the Trinity ad intra, that is to say, within itself. What is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? What do they do? What is their 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 main task? Um, a facetious way of saying it is, what does God do all day? And the fourth question is, what is the relationship um, with us? Now, let's begin with the with the processions. Um, in other words, from how do you postulate the three persons in the one God? And here, remember, we began this series, first of all, by talking about the new presentation of the faith by John Paul II, but then when we began talking about God, we suggested that questions that we ask ourselves lead to an openness regarding God. That is to say, when we ask questions of ourselves, especially very fundamental questions about who we are and where we are going, this then yields a openness to the answers which can only come from God himself. Uh, ref, uh, looking into our own experience, looking into our own uh, human events, day-to-day -day events, can help us understand something about the processions in the Trinity. And remember, we said before that any example that tries to help us understand the divine nature limps a bit. Well, it's even more true when you talk about the Trinity, that these Examples are only uh, help us in, in the sense of pointing the way, not in a complete, total understanding of uh, the mystery that we won't even comprehend in heaven, as we said. But <clears throat> we begin by, by realizing that since we have a mind and a will, so does God, because he created us. So he has to have all the perfections that he gave us. One of those perfections is that he can think, and another perfection is that he can choose. In other words, he has a mind and a will. Now, what is the first thing that we come to know? Well, if you look at a child, at a baby, the first knowledge that a child seems to develop is that of himself. And parents usually, especially with the first child, maybe with the second as well, love to, to watch this. The, the child discovers himself. He discovers his hands, his fingers, his feet. We come to know ourselves first before we know the world around us. And then, of course, the first discovery of another is usually the mother and father, particularly the mother. Now, so it's a self-knowledge that we come to first. Well, the same, same is true with God. 
the first thing he knows, the first one he knows is himself. But remember, everything he knows is perfect. All right. So when God knows himself, in a certain sense, that's the only thing he knows. Because before everything, he is. And in time, he made things. But he knew himself from all eternity, from the from from time without end. There was not a time that he did not know himself because there was not a time that he did not exist. There is no time for God. So this process of knowing himself is not a process. It's instantaneous. It's forever, for all eternity. It's part of him. So he knows himself. And this in knowing himself, he knows everything that he creates and everything that he doesn't create. This knowledge of himself is absolutely perfect. In other words, there's there's no uh, admission of error in this. There's no question of not having a perfect image of himself. Not only does he know himself, but he knows that he's knowing himself. He has this awareness, this consciousness, this mirror image of his own knowledge. And that's absolutely perfect as well. Now, to be perfect, it has to be identical. To be identical, it has to exist, because he exists. And so the self-knowledge of the Father is the Son existing. It's the self-knowledge of the Father. The self-awareness of the Father's act of knowing himself is perfect. To be perfect, it has to be identical to him. To be identical to him, it has to exist, and that's the Son. The Son is begotten, not made. There never was a time he did not exist because there never was a time when God did not know himself and know himself perfectly. We will continue this discussion of the processions in the Trinity on the next program of Faith for Today. Thank you for listening. I'm Father Richard Hogan of Priests for Life. Join us again next time for Faith for Today with Father Richard Hogan here on EWTN Global Catholic Radio.